Thank you. You're able to join the planning commission tonight. We have a vacancy. Have a vacancy. Unless you want to do this a little longer. He's here, so yeah. he didn't tell me he wouldn't be here. He's in town. I saw him today. But. Oh, is that a car coming? White. Yeah, White SUV. Yeah, that's him. Oh, sorry, Dana. <laughs> Just fired and fired immediately. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for your service. regular meeting on Tuesday, December 19th. It is 7.04 p.m. Um, in attendance for the meeting, we have Kim McFarland, Kent Johnson, Seth Crabtree, Kevin Howland, possibly Dustin B. Gingrich. Um, first item on the agenda is discuss the brew tonight adding mineral processing and extraction to the industrial land use matrix. Uh, this is piggybacking off of last month's meeting. Um, kind of the, I got a gathered consensus was to have more of an understanding about extractive or extracting minerals um, and to review other cities, what they may be doing uh, in that nature. I couldn't find anything relating to specifically uh, like A1's uh, kind of business operations. Um, I have spent a lot of time in this finer's dictionary, which is definition for a lot of uh, what a lot of municipalities use to define various uh, land use matrix. I, I, there's a lot of them. The extractive industry, if you do mineral extracting, it could be anything from petroleum to water even to, to any kind of mineral. <coughs> so I don't know where you guys kind of want to go. There's not really a specific word that we're looking for. It all kind of includes open pit mining, quarry, sand and gravel, any kind of mineral extracting. So... Yeah, and I think we need to identify those separately because they are not they're not the same thing. Yeah. Um, 
this is kind of just a quick thing that Todd provided to me. Um, still, it doesn't really help us in our certain scenario. My thought is we either use the definitions of light, medium, and heavy industry, or we do mineral extraction minus like open pit mines, minus whatever that we're concerned with being in an industrial one zone, and then all that into industrial two and industrial three. I guess for me, and I never considered until I saw that out there quarrying. Um, does that start to get into the definition of open pit, and that's mm -hmm. already existing here? Yeah, we do have some already sand, gravel, and quarries in industrial one. But it is not, I, I would think that it's not a desired activity for most industrial one. Because Our, yeah, I think, I think you're probably kind of correct on that. Um, because that's supposed to be the buffer zone. <coughs> for low dust, low sound, mm -hmm. and that nature. And chlorine is a, a, a high, high dust, high noise um, environment. Yeah. And so the, the ones that are existing in a I-1 wouldn't be, they, they would be grandfathered in, but it wouldn't allow, we wouldn't want to allow new quarries in that, in the I-1 zone. Yeah. yeah, I agree. And I think the ones that are there weren't within city limits. Uh, when time. they start, yeah, mm -hmm. the cities uh, has expanded since. Yeah, well, the one up here definitely was not. The city used to use the one, I think the one you're talking about down mm -hmm. Hastings. Yeah. yeah, the city used to use it for its own concrete. So. so I think like open pit is the one distinguishable definition we have discussed. Um, and if, I mean, David and I talked a little bit earlier of, of looking at, you know, throwing out the exclusion of that, but is there other specific definitions in this I, that... I think so. I think somehow we want to define that as extraction and split that out into separate definitions. Okay, are we extracting mineral from an from a ore body that we have in a container? Mm -hmm. Or are we extracting mineral from the earth? And I think we ought to exclude extracting mineral from the earth in I-1, for sure. Mm -hmm. And we can define it as that. If you're extracting from the earth in I-1, that, that should be prohibited. Because that would cover open pits or drilling or boring or mining of any kind. Except that if they're pumping liquid, if they're pumping water, at the, the brine as their base and filter running that through a filter and then injecting that back in somewhere else. That's a different level of hazard and noise and, and contamination than, than the other types of, of extraction. Like, for instance, the uranium milk. So the uranium is going to be taking, you know, hard rock and, yeah. and, <coughs> and processing that um, in a in a way that is different than the proposed that's, lithium. Yeah, that's, that's processing. That's not extracting it from the ground. That, that, that's processing. It. That is that that's is correct, but that is still. Um, well, so, so it's mineral processing. Processing, yeah. we call it processing and extraction as two different things. I just, you know, there's some stuff that, you know. Mineral processing is kind of more of their definitions. They are extracting it a long ways away um, from their location. Which one? A1. And part of so. 
I mean, this is adding it to the matrix. So if you if you refer to the matrix on ten eight two two two, I guess yeah. Um, so we have the three different industrial zones. We already have some <coughs> industries listed here with permitted, conditional, not permitted. Um, so David and I talked about this earlier as well. Of you know, we talked about my concern with this is you get into kind of the weeds of very specific different types of mineral processing extraction. That's kind of what we're talking about. So does it make sense to condition it in some, you know, we'll do food processing, for example, because it's what I'm looking at. That is one that's a conditional in I1, I2, and it's permitted in I3. Um, so my interpretation there is we're able to look at some of these factors of noise, of dust, of those are all things that are addressed in our conditions where a quarry versus someone boring might have different, a quarry you're going to look at and say oh, you're going to have dust. We're not going to allow that under a condition A boring, there's minimal dust. Um, so it does allow a little bit more flexibility for the specifics of what could come in because it's hard for us to foresee what is going to be their exact process and, and define that out in open pit or this or this or this um, and just looking at you know people's opinion of do we condition it in any of those zones or permit it in any of those zones in any kind of matrix that way so so I would say if you're going to do um, maybe some some more clear, clear definitions in and say open quarry, op open um, rock quarry, then that would not be conditional in one, be conditional in two, and and uh, permitted in three. Um, could you, do you think you still want to get as specific as each type of extraction? Or could you do mineral processing and extraction, <coughs> leave it at that, and still do condition or permitted in, in the different matrix? I think if, if we want to simplify it and the bare bones, I think we could say not <coughs> permitted in I1, conditional in 2, and conditional in 3. And, and just look at that, and then every one that comes in gets looked at. I mean, obviously in I3, I mean, the bar is pretty low, so pretty much everything would get in, but it would give the, the commission and the city a chance to look at it and know what's happening. As opposed to, you know, some stuff, a lot of dust that's in the I3 that's out on the east side, but we don't care. Prevailing wind is out of the south and the west, so we don't, I mean, obviously it's not going to be a problem. But if you just say we can have a quarry thing or whatever, and we start creating a lot of dust and stuff, and we're just out here just west of town, obviously that's going to create a dust cloud that comes into town constantly because of the prevailing winds. That's the thing that we have to look at. So maybe just do it that way, and then we can just look at each one rather than having to sit here. With us here, like I speak for myself, that I don't know all the ins and outs of all this mineral extraction. And I don't want to have to sit down and try to piecemeal out say, and come up with definitions for each way that I don't even have any understanding of what it is. That's what I feel. So it's probably best to do it, I think, that way and, and do it conditionally. <coughs> Then we look at it, and, and the people that are wanting to do the work come in, and they explain their process and how it works and what what the downfalls and the upsides would be, and then it can just be approved that way. So your suggestion of what you just threw out was not permitted I1, condition I2, permitted I3? Condition. Condition. So not condition, condition yeah. is what you threw out. And conditional, I mean, we can't deny it. If they meet all the criteria, we can't deny it. They get to do it. That's, yeah. We can't legally deny it. So if they meet all the conditions, yeah. mm -hmm. then we can't legally deny it. They get to do it. It's not like it's we're telling people, you can't do this. It's we want to review it and make sure it's a fit for where you want to do it. 
Yeah. Yeah, good point. I was going to say, even though it's listed as conditional, we are technically permitting it. We're just going to put, possibly put special conditions yeah. on the request. Well, and we can it, deny it. With, I mean, one of our things is, you know, dust or things. If, if, they're, yeah. if they're proposing something that that's, their entire process creates dust clouds, then that denies yeah. them in that. We would have to be very specific on the reasons for the denial. So yeah. whether it be yeah, dust exactly. or severe yeah. Uh, yeah. harm to surrounding neighbors, etc. Yeah. So they, they come and done the training on that. And actually, it's Todd that's the one that done that for us. And he said you do have to be very specific on the denial, and it has to be yeah. for a very real and good purpose, mm -hmm. or it's not legal, and you, and you can't do it. Yeah. So. I do think that we should consider having um, maybe some type of the hazardous classification in that process. Yeah, okay. that if if there is you know if there is minimal hazard as determined by whatever standard we can apply, then um, then maybe it. Uh, the, that extraction process could occur in I-1. But if there is, you know, if there is toxic chemicals that are above a certain quantity, if there is um, the risk of uh, radiation exposure um, or, or other things, then that elevates the risk and it would push it into a different zone, a, a different um, yeah, it's a different industrial zone. Well, I think what you're saying still falls within our <coughs> our conditional use criteria. You know, there's the use is not detrimental to public health, safety, and welfare. Right there, what classifications they are bringing to us, we can consider into that. So, so maybe we need to expand that definition then. Um, and that uh, restrictions are placed according to um, potential toxicity and um, and quantity of of toxic materials. I think you're getting a little too in the weeds. Yeah, there's. I think. Part I mean, we can look at our EGR that has our. You know our evacuation zones and things like that, and say if this chemical were to get out and your evacuation zone is whatever a mile or something, and you're trying to build this next to a residential that's in within a half a mile, no, right there that's detrimental to public health because if this chemical got out, your evacuation zone needs to be this or you know I, I think I think even with sort of the the general term we have in our criteria what they bring to the table we can, if those if those are the concerns of what is what is the chemical or what is the what are you using or, or things like that. So well I I just think that that would give us more footing to stand on for a denial or for um for saying that it needs to be in this zone instead of this zone. We would have to research to decide what we consider as a high level, low level, because mm -hmm. I have no idea what that would be. Correct. <coughs> I think if we stayed with Ken's proposal of not permitting it in I-1, <coughs> I-2, I-3, I mean looking at our map, I-1 or open space creates a buffer between any exposure to where anybody would be habitable. Um, you know, there's still transportation line going through, but that's any hazardous material that drives through this town every day, so. Correct. The train. Oh, oh. Does anybody have any other opinion on Ken's proposal and just of the not permitted, conditional permitted? I would be in favor of that. Yeah. 
what's the... I have a comment. As of November 14th, there were 
And so I mean, you can't we need vote to make sure already, that already knowing those though, because this anything, and that's why I'm I'm wanting but, to but make we sure need we to know how that's going to impact how this policy is going to impact that. We can, but I could bring a proposal table tomorrow to say I'm going to use a giant magnet to pull stuff out of the ground. I mean, you don't know what's going to fall on the table tomorrow, and that's where we need to either be specific mm -hmm. enough to cover what we can or broad enough to cover what possibilities are out there. Um, that's my concern when we start to break this down into open pit or this or this or this. You don't know what someone's going to bring on the table tomorrow. Open pit, I could go out with my mini X and start digging. Are you going to call that an open pit? Like It just gets too much in the weeds for me of what, what all that means, and we need to figure out a language that's going to cover it I think the conditional use covers some of what our concerns are with each specific process, whether that's open pit, whether that's boring, whether that's my giant magnet that's going to suck metal out of the ground. It's our conditions are meant to be what is going to affect the general community or those around or the environment or things like that. So, but I think having having the right choice of you know, if we don't allow this in I-1 and it is an industry that needs the closer connections of I-1, needs the utilities, needs that, but it doesn't have any um, detrimental problems and we're not allowing it, then are we limiting what industry is coming here? So I get, you know, a little bit more research into... <coughs> And, and you know, maybe it does circle back around to looking at our our conditions and are, are we covering all of our bases with those. But yeah, I just think all of us maybe have a little bit specific concerns and not throwing that back on David to come back with that information and doing some research of solving some of our questions we all have individually. We do need to do some, I agree with Kayla, she with Kayla. Um, we, I think I could see if we had a very narrow definition of what was permitted and instead of just one line here and then we just put it here and what we do actually break it out into two different lines where one is conditional in I-1 and permitted permitted and then the next, the next level up would be not permitted and conditional permitted. But we need to do some, do some research and learn what that is. And if we want a pretty narrow definition of it, then we could go with an I-1. And I don't know and enough about it, and that's kind of what we're and saying. Hey, that's yeah. why I went with my suggestion. If, if we have got to move on it tonight, then that's my suggestion. Because I just don't know enough about it, and that covers the bases. Yeah, and if we could find a precedent if someone else has said, oh, you know, you can divide the two processes into A and B, and A is less detrimental and B is more, and, you know, but yeah, I don't, I don't want to be a mineral processing expert, so. Okay, so it sounds like I have a motion to table it. I'll second. Ten seconds. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay, we'll table that. Um, so, do you want to have a specific homework for each of us, or just general across the board? Find what you can. Find what you can, but I will. I'll try to do a little bit and send some stuff out and encourage people to look into yes. directions. And I, I think that would word. probably be one of the most we're helpful a more things ahead of time. is that if we can get some some samples and send them out early, and then um, <coughs> and even ask for a one or some of the companies that what are what are where are some of the cities that you're you're either working in or your competitors are working in that have ordinances similar to what we're going to need to, be, to develop. Okay. <coughs> I was looking at North Salt Lakes um, City Code. Mm -hmm. If you go to our Green River uh, Code page, is, if you can look, anybody that's with this code library, the codifiers, 
you can review any ordinances that have been passed all across the United States. Um, North Salt Lake does have one for mineral extraction, and they kind of just split it between off-site, on-site type stuff. They don't really have, they have like permits, things of that, but I don't know. Those are specific permits to the city, so unless I ask for one, I don't know how they go through the well, permit and approve the process. <laughs> but that's somewhere I think you can start, Steph. Might help. Yep. All right, number two, discuss residential homes within non-residential zones. So, I think, yeah, last meeting we brought it up, it was brought up to review the homes within commercial zones. Well, I just said residential homes and non-residential zones, so it could be any zone that homes are not allowed. But I think this pertains mostly to the commercial zone and along Main Street, where most of the first block, if not farther, has uh, residential homes in it, but is under a commercial zone. I don't know where we want to start looking or reviewing on those. I think part of the question was uh, where the commercial zone is right now. Does it does it make sense of where that line has been drawn? Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if it's just homes. If you're going to encompass a solution there, I mean, there's there's home, you know, some that exist right on the offset of Main Street, mm -hmm. and. Um, yeah, I think part of it was, it seemed like that line was drawn for whatever reason back historically when the zoning was made with that commercial zone, just whatever offset on north and south and just to some extent it looks like it, it looped around some things, but to some extent it just goes straight across whatever distance that is off the road. Yeah, they did 600 feet for the first yeah. block. Yeah, that was um, 600 feet. But they also encompassed some already, like say, up uh, KOA, stuff like that. They kind of drew that line down. I don't know what this line is. I guess maybe down Broadway. They kind of just kept that. So from what I could find was they said first block or 600 feet for the first block. Um, and then they just through those shapes around pre-existing businesses at the time. And that was a, that and I, was think, a I think some of the issues, because to me it's better to have, in just where our zoning's drawn, easier to take and say I want to put a house or I want to make a house in a commercial zone and get a conditional use than vice versa. Mm -hmm. But I know some of these problems are arising and people wanting to purchase a residence that falls within a commercial and they're having trouble getting a loan on that because it is in a commercial zone. Yeah. Um, so, it, I mean, it's a little bit hard to, I don't, you know, we can, I don't think we can ever adjust our commercial zone and eliminate all houses unless we did a jigsaw puzzle on it. And, yeah, I, I don't know other than throwing that back to, like, the lenders of, like, I right, why aren't you... Mm -hmm. Loaning on what is a rent, what you know, to go through the process to be a conditional use, you're, you're basically designating that as a residence, and that's what the process would have to be if you wanted to build a home within the commercial zone. So, I, I know we brought this up last time because of some of the discussion with where that zone lands, but I'm not sure what the, necessarily the answer is to. Yeah, I don't have. Yeah, uh, uh, and I agree with you. I think the, the reason this became an issue was people trying to purchase a home and the bank saying that they won't loan them money on a commercial, uh, on, a, on a residential house in a commercial zone. And it doesn't make sense. I mean, I don't know enough that, about that issue. To the issue that specifically brought this up was the issue of wanting to purchase a residence that wasn't originally a residential property that's in commercial right. and half the building was in commercial and half of it was in residential 
and it wasn't originally built as a home. It was actually, it was originally a church. Mm -hmm. So, and then wanting to convert that to a home and trying to get a loan to buy the property with all of those discrepancies. I don't think it was any one specific thing. It was just a whole bunch of stuff that made the bank really nervous about it. And, you know, so we corrected one thing by just putting it all in residential. But I doubt that's the last hurdle they're going to be jumping with that property. Now, like a home, <coughs> it's a, a home that's there, it's livable, somebody's been living in it. And, you know, I don't think a, a mortgage lending institution is going to look at it and say, well, it's in a commercial zone where I can't loan you money on it. Because everything, I mean, you, you can go back to the, the Constitution of Utah, state code, the Constitution of the United States, everything that was permitted before that is still in use that hasn't terminated its use is grandfathered. We can't have an ex post facto law, period. Because you're so, not changing the use of the So as long as you're not changing the use of it, I don't see this as a major issue. And, but, and, and, and like you said, we can't sit there and draw this line that goes yeah. like this with our commercial zone. It's silly. And with a, a residential home that was then proposed to become commercial in that zone, that still wouldn't have any problem because that would be conforming yeah. use. Um, whereas if it was outside of that and tried to go commercial, then they'd have to do the conditional use and things like that. Yeah. So, and I think where they would run into the problem is if they bought commercial property in a commercial zone and wanted to build a new home. Yes. They would probably run into problems in lending institutions there. And I can see where that would be a problem. Unless so is know, the subdivision use that you guys were working on down in there, is that is, is that a different color or is that um, the that was doing? Uh -huh. um, it's commercial and we had got a conditional use to build homes in it. Okay. Yeah. The city or like Steph kind of mentioned, the city already has a process for you to have a residential home in a, in a commercial zone by using a conditional use yeah. permit. And it's the lenders with the recent house or loan drops and housing. <coughs> they are skeptical on loaners buying homes that are a legal non-conforming use, meaning that like uh -huh. can't set. Okay. So it's just discussion so I think that came up from the concerns of last time, and if everybody's just kind of good how we are, I think. So I guess we just wait and see if we have other issues come up, and then we discuss it at that point. I just, I just kind of thought maybe, anyway. Okay. You know, there's a lot of homes in the area that the city's trying to get cleaned up. Many of them are going to have to be dealt. So, in that case, do you have to come back as commercial? Yeah. Unless there was a, unless, if they demoed it themselves, yes, they would have to, they want to build or rebuild. But if it was an act of nature or a you know, tornado or a fire, you can rebuild the same footprint. But if it was demo, it would then they would be changing the use of it so that it has to be commercial. So you can so so or go through the conditional use permit. Or go through the conditional use permit, yeah, correct. So so the city has the conditional use permit that is an is that an administrative no um, um, option, so, or... You guys. Yeah, I'll continue okay. use I drew this very quickly. This would be that shape, and I think we're on agreement, but I was just doing it while you guys were discussing. This would be that shape of residential housing within a commercial zone. Mm -hmm. So it would just be all over the place. And, and that doesn't include the north side of the road, which, the which are place. right adjacent to Main Street <coughs> as well. So and that's... That's probably why back when this was drawn, they, they just went and said, okay, we're just going to go 600 feet and deal with each thing as it comes along so we don't have this, well, that right there. 
Yeah, yeah, it's pretty, pretty wild. All right, um, three discuss fence ordinance ten twelve seven under supplementary procedures applicable to zones. So, anytime I've had to discuss the fence ordinance, it hasn't been well received. <laughs> um, so I, also, so. I also agree that because one thing, one thing that I really look at, it doesn't even differ from if it's residential to commercial to industrial. Because I think some, maybe some industrial places, they need to have a privacy fence. They we, we may want them to, but they can't based on the code. Um, but even with residential homes. I feel like our setback for anything higher than four feet is too far. Um, Tyler kind of wanted to be here to sponsor this code because um, he would like to see a change. Uh, he's just recently, they had a baby, so he doesn't want to be around a group of people. <laughs> um, currently, the setback is 40 feet from the road. And most homes, uh, even in our R1 setback zones, two and three, it's either 20 or yeah, 25 or 20. So I feel like 20 is is, is fine as far as the setback goes. Um, so this is essentially saying, just to kind of put this in, in, in drawn out terms like my head goes. Mm -hmm. So your house is set at 20 feet back. Right now we're saying if you wanted, you could not exceed four feet up to 40 feet. So if you wanted to pull like a backyard up to your house line, you would have to have a side mm -hmm. fence or a front side fence essentially not taller than four feet. Mm -hmm. I, I think the 40 feet is excessive. I, I was reading this before we started the meeting and I, I you know, it should, you should be able to run the, the six foot side obscuring fence for your backyard that's what you want to do. You ought to be able to run that up to a parallel line in front of your house. I mean, front of the house. That's right. pretty much. If you go drive down any street in anywhere in USA, that's pretty much how it is. Yeah. And I think that's a good way of doing it. We could write that where it says, you know, your side obscuring fence has to be on a parallel, even with the front of the house, and that that covers everything. And you don't have to put a bridge in there because we allow 20 feet for the house. But what if somebody wants to go back 25 feet? Mm -hmm. Well, you, you still, for the look, the aesthetics of it, it's still going to look the best even with the front of the house. Okay. And it gives people the, the opportunity to come up to the front of their house with their backyard yeah. and tie that right in. And in a lot of places you go in, in neighborhoods all over the place, you're going to see that where this this is the front of your house right here, mm -hmm. and your fence comes up here and the side obscuring right here, and you'll have a gate or something to go in there. And actually, Orem City actually requires that. Mm -hmm. I know that from my brother living there for a while. They actually require that. Depending mm -hmm. upon what you do with your backyard, they require you to have side obscuring and to hide it. Corner lots, how does that affect those? Corner lots do have your. Okay, I wish it wasn't so far. Okay. Yeah. The side triangle depth is at least six feet within. Fences, walls, or hedges that front on a corner lot must maintain a site triangle minimum depth of at least six feet. Then on site the backyards where a fence wall or hedge is constructed parallel to around on a corner lot, the fence shall be set back five feet from the back of the curb or side street. Oh, yes. Yeah. So you'll have your from your curb five feet. Which is kind of typical because you yeah. probably have a side have a sidewalk, sidewalk, and sidewalk and before you feet. Yeah. So. And then your side triangle about these six feet back. Literally, the top is toasting. 
It's all comfortable. <laughs> it's cold a minute ago. Because you're been in, you, you're in the hot seat. That's why. <laughs> you're getting grilled. I, I mean, we could take feedback from what people are saying, and I think you and I can sit down and propose, try to draft some changes that we can vote on for next meeting. Next meeting, okay. Yeah, Anybody good. else have kind of anything? I'm I'm comfortable with removing 40 feet, having it to either yeah, sure. kind of like what you were saying to whatever your front side. Even with is. the front, even, even with the front, the front of the house. Of the house. Of the house. Just okay. That's the easy. That's well, the, like the easiest to set back of your zone. Covers everything, I think. Set front set back of this zone. Although I think they're all it, the same. It's really though. silly be the same? to have somebody's the house 20 feet 20 20. in the house, and you got to go 40 feet with the fence. I mean. The house is 12 feet tall, and you can't have a six-foot fence even with it. Yeah. So we'll keep the rest of the, and it's we'll like still bring this next month. But we can look at what changes yeah. might need to be made to make it applicable to commercial. Where yeah. We do yeah. And, then, and there's some stuff we may want to write an addendum for commercial and industrial both. I feel like those can probably be administratively approved if you wanted to put it that way. Other cities that I looked okay. at, they that's kind of how it was. It was just administrative approved, um, okay. which would fall on to me or whatever team they have. In this case, it would fall on to me. But, um, yeah, that was all separate as far as this. They would separate it residential, industrial, commercial. But I feel like we can keep our basic format we have here and then, like you say, have an addendum of like commercial or industrial. How you guys want that word? Yeah, like that. Yeah, I would like to see some wording that that specifies what requirements industrial and commercial have. Yeah, we need something in there for them because this this ordinance is written primarily for industrial for residential. You can see that by the way it's worded and laid out in the thought process. Yeah. And there was no allowance made for industrial and commercial there. So. I agree. Do we have any public comment that you want to? Let's talk about fences. Yes. You don't want to talk about fences? <laughs> Not really. Okay. <laughs> Moving on. I've heard of that. I, I just have one other thing on fences. Is this, this route really seems to um, regard properties that are on the street. Um, and just looking at it, if, if you have a lot that's kicked back somewhere, for instance, like mine, I wouldn't even know how that would fit in, mm -hmm. how I could put fence on my property and meet the standard. And I don't know how that would be worded. I'm happy to look at some other stuff and see. But sense. if we're going to address this issue, mm -hmm. let's, let's address the entire issue. So. Yeah, because it does, so like flag lots or even like your mm -hmm. law. If it came to me, I think we should have something that addresses yeah, it. If it came to me, I'd be like, well, you're past the 40 feet, so you start at six. <laughs> yeah, but I want to be my entire property. But yeah. The <laughs> game, where are you going? Yeah. I'm merged right there. I think your, your fence, your whole lower door fence, the front of the house, it's all about the site, be able to see people right. coming. Mm -hmm. Her situation, if you're not on main road, yeah. totally different, you know. Yeah. I mean, obviously, right. I mean, you go around and go put a six foot fence on your whole piece, but... Yeah, nobody will even know until and then that, But then that's like, okay, that's quite a bit of money. <laughs> I'll but, yeah. to fork out six feet of fence. I mean, that's, that's crazy, but... I mean, obviously, you just have to work that in. I don't... Because I think more of it's the line of sight. Mm -hmm. For people driving down the road, yeah. or where someone can see something coming out to the road, where you're not getting yeah, yeah absolutely, are getting stroked. Yeah. Line of sight and fire. And Dave and I talked about it a little bit. You know, people are coming to the table with potential issues or questions in constructing a fence, but there's also the enforcement of things that aren't a fence but obstruct the line of sight. You know, someone in town argued they should have a taller fence because their neighbor already has junk that is obstructing the line of sight. So why can't they build a fence to block out that junk for their obstruction? So there's kind of an argument, so I think it, you know, again, I, I don't mean to come back on David, I come back kind of on the city as a whole of, 
you know, if, if we're going to be sitting here at this table making this code for people that are wanting to do new construction, which to me a fence is usually an improvement of your property and trying to, you know, mm -hmm. hide your own backyard or different things, um, it, it comes back onto enforcement of what are other things that are obstruction, overgrown vegetation, trailers, cars, all that kind of stuff. Yep. Cars on top of each other, however. Yeah. And, and I guess the other thing is is agricultural. So so I'll throw in another thing is is agricultural fences. So <laughs> so you know if if, if I've got um, agricultural property next to my house and I'm limited to a four foot fence, that creates a hazard because my horses may jump that. Mm -hmm. Train them not to. Um, no. <laughs> <laughs> We're talking about side obscuring. I mean, you could do a non side obscuring fence that well, keeps. Only the you kind of track the only have four well, feet. Something needs to be put in there, you know, like right here with you, the fence is not side obscuring, like such as chain link or similar type material, but it does not exceed four feet in height, except for in agricultural or in the case of. Containing livestock. Tyler and Ren met earlier today, and I'm just reading from their notes. Um, he says he leans towards the industrial zones having free reign as long as the fences are engineered of higher than six feet, um, but also could be site obscured at six feet. So maybe. We can look at agriculture at that point too. We can figure something out. Yeah, that, but but I don't want a site obscuring six foot fence for for agriculture. Okay. <laughs> no, I mean you, you definitely don't go to six feet for agriculture. Yeah. You can go up that high, but not have to go up that high. Right. Yeah. I mean, yeah, and, and well, and and you don't want to limit that because I mean. For instance, the bird farm, when that was that was functioning, they would need a fence that's higher than six feet. When you go yeah. to six feet, um, it has to be engineer plans to be above yeah. six feet. But they would be fine because they're far enough away from the road to start that six feet. Yours, where it's down, Sharon, not Sharon, uh, Tamarack. Tamarack. Would that technically fall under a side? It's a front. I mean, it's, it's the, the front, front the side <laughs> <laughs> right. the and, the, yeah. and the side of the house, you know, so. Yeah, I think it's something to look into, though. So. Okay. All right, number four. Can we find any more? <laughs> yeah, <right. laughs> what other fences do we have to pick up? <laughs> Discuss zoning change and or development of parcel ID 01-154B-0044 located along South Green River Boulevard. So this one I'm passing off kind of through to the planning commission. I feel like it would end up here anyway. Um, we have... Donna? Your name is Donna. Wow, I used to have Donna over here, so it threw me off. Your dad. Um, so Donna Trino, they have some property um, or looking, what we're looking at is Chat Hunt's old property down Greenwood Boulevard. Um, they have some ideas for housing, um, maybe some vacation homes, and I'll let you guys add anything to that if you'd like. Do you have the Yes. Here we go. So that's kind of what just well I guess it's okay. Look. Give me a second to figure out. Okay. So, so that's coming down going south, down there. Yeah, this would be So we were trying to up. um use the five acres as both housing and Tiny home type cabin, look like tiny homes but cabins, but we don't want like a camp, typical campground with um, trailers being pulled in and stuff like that. Um, but we were trying to keep it to where the housing would be close to the current housing, um, so the road would be coming in on the north side um, along that, with the housing up along the other housing that's on the north of it, and also to the 
was so about um, pushing the healthy towards the back. And I took consideration of um, the measurements that I was told, keep the roads, things like that, I was able to fit that in. Retention pond, it's just be as the site, we'd have to check in to see the size if needed, where it may be. That was just an idea of where we could put it to try and keep the housing separate from the campground. Um, also, the campground um, being towards the main road is directly across the street from the state park. Um, so it fits in with um, that. They're both you know, close by. And then this is ALK now um, to the south of that area. So we're trying to keep the housing close to the housing, the um, campground area close to the campground area um, with that grassy area in between um, two separate entrances, one for the subdivision area and the other one to the south would be to go into the campground area. Um, and yeah, he was just confused on kind of what, because right now it's R1, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, looking at R3, I mean you can talk about what you're okay. confused on or what we should look at doing. So there's tons of different things I, I was looking at. Um, R1 is typically for, as we know, our uh, single family homes. They can have some duplexes as long as they resemble a single family home. I think my, oh, let me get to the area. There we are. So yeah, we're located right here, R1 zone. Um, My questions and where I'm stuck on is what zone would allow both housing and these kind of vacation homes, I guess we could call them. Because um, in R1, R2, R3, R3 does allow boarding homes, stuff like that. But our other code says that you only allow one home on each piece of property. So if they were looking to do this area. Are you thinking those as like long term rentals, like grammar renting that, or these like no, no more or less basically well like Moab has a ton of them. They have their own little cabins. So kind of like a vacation so rentals. It's basically like a campground but it's not you know obviously not campground cabins. Yeah, so yeah. just coming to pay nightly. I just want to, I mean, like, I'm not going for the typical cabin look. So yeah. I would I say tiny home just because I'm wanting something unique. If you're not just walking in and looking at some log cabins. But it would be know. essentially kind of like a, a overnight, maybe like a, hotel a business is what, yeah. yeah. So I, I think, I mean, just off the cuff, whether it, and we could potentially look at what that whole area, whether that whole area should really be R1 or some of that should be divided because that starts to, to come into where we already have smaller homes there, we already have, or smaller lots, we already have. Um, trailer park down there, things like that. So we can evaluate that whole zone, but just kind of making it off tough whether that whole area becomes R3, dividing those lots up. And, and I'm thinking it's kind of similar to what Epicenter had to do with that big parcel they got. So dividing the individual house lots. Why does it keep doing that? Sorry, I don't know why. Yeah, keep looking up and like, okay, we're taking this on a tour. Um, so dividing the individual house lots, leaving that large lot in the center, and then getting a conditional use to potentially have a campground, is what we would call it, um, on that lot. Whether that would So you're work. saying, like, because he was thinking R3 for the whole thing, that would be good. Because R3 can have single family homes, correct? Mm -hmm. Yes, and they would be, so, depending on what your lot size is, you're looking at, I'm assuming, kind of smaller ones. Um, just depending on what your lot size is. If your lot size fits within the R1, they could be R1, but if you're if you're wanting to do smaller lots on there, then R3 is what would make the most sense. And then we kind of wanted a little bit like right now. I drew up like an idea of just the typical. We did. Third, I know the setbacks can be smaller than this, um, but I think the benefit of being a green over is having a little bit larger lot than what we have up north. But, so right now he's kind of doing off on the larger side. I mean, we have 30 foot um, backyards, say a 30 foot house, 25 foot front yard. I know we can make those smaller according to what's allowable. So, 
kind of this is where our preliminary idea, but also want to kind of look and see kind of what type of housing is needed in Green River. Is it more, I mean, we could get more home, homes in there that are smaller homes, but is that what's needed, or is would somebody like some bigger homes? You know, so I kept the lot sizes right now a little bit larger to get some larger homes. Um, some other ideas I had, and I don't know if this had to do with like what zoning was up to. Um, I know when we first moved from Green River, we purchased a some property up north, had a single family home with a detached garage with an apartment above it. We really ran out that one bedroom apartment, made half of our rent. I think that is a huge thing that people in Green River not afford homes, but what that could do for them to have if we could do something like that. To where because some of these like corner lots, um, see that one right there in the corner, they're large enough that you could do possibly a detached garage with an apartment above or something that just gives more options for people that people aren't used to here. That up there, I mean, like we live in Lehigh. They are making it to where nobody can, they cannot say no to a accessory dwelling unit um, as long as it's smaller than their own home, um, maybe the state is staying in. But, um, but it just helps people go for home. And I think that's a huge thing during our people count. I mean, especially prices are so high. To go give them different options of whether they have a little tiny accessory dwelling unit in their backyard or whether it be, you know, hey, we put it above our garage, we really run out, we have like, whole bunch of different ideas of what we can do. It's just kind of more like we want to try and have a little bit of time to figure out what's most needed in Green River. Maybe some of the lots would be, because where we built our house, um, Don did all the housing in that whole development. Um, they had single family homes around the exterior, duplexes around the exterior, houses, single family homes, oh, okay, twin homes. Um, Ours was a single family home with the apartment above the garage, and then in the center was all townhomes. So they had mixed areas, but it leaves it open for so many different incomes for people. So with this, I thought, depending on different sides of lots, you know, we could do just some small 1,000, 1,200 square foot homes, um, but we, there is areas where we could, you know, hey, let's do a little bit, maybe a smaller home, but accessory apartment that can help people to be able to afford a home. Um, and I think. Green River needs more open, you know, if there's, like I said, he said there's, the zoning right now, there's not things that just like, doesn't fit into one of the specific zones, but to be open to, I don't know, that's what we thought maybe R3 would be good. We could do some smaller homes if we found, hey, there's a lot of people, or maybe there's five people that say, I would love a small home, that's all I can afford. We could shrink some of these lots to do that. Or maybe there's more people that want to have, you know, standard size home, lots, whatever. But we could kind of mix. But I was trying to just keep it to where we weren't putting campground right next to the existing homes. And that's why we wanted to separate it and be considerate of the people there, keep the campground area close to the campground areas on the main road. Um, and then also we were looking at doing, um, like, housekeeping residents on the property along with, like, New York Pavilion next to it. <coughs> Um, and other point. So just whatever, um, just kind of keeping it open. We're just trying to go through our bank loans. They're just trying to say, hey, what is it for one? We need to figure out the zoning, what is allowed. And then the banks, they're all for, they seem to be a great thing for Green River we talk to, to see how it's all needed. Um, and the campground for us is, for us at, at some point, I mean, Don's here, he lives here more than he is up there. So something that we could, at some point, if needed or wanted, to move back to Green River. And obviously, he's not getting younger and can't keep doing what he's doing forever. So to us, it's hey, something that we could turn to as something to bring us care when we're older and ready and could take care of. But in the meantime, help keep, continue to help the town with housing and you know, like we've been doing, but on a bigger scale. So the lot size, how many acres are they? Um, I didn't figure out acreage. I have like each one, like 85, like say this, 85 by 85 was this one. Um, it fits the setbacks that are required on like eight and eight. I did like 10 and 10 on a lot of them. Um, it fit all the requirements for the setbacks. So I didn't actually figure out how much the acreage is on them. Each one is a little bit different, so. 
So R3, R3 would give you the most flexibility because it allows you to go to that smaller so size, but you can always go bigger. Mm -hmm. um, so feet if you find you want that mix or you're finding it makes sense to have some smaller, you can request a zone change to R3. If you decide the life lot sizes you want fit right now or whatever you propose them within the R1, I think you could just try to keep it as R1. Um, you're obviously going to go through the process of a subdivision depending on how many lots you want to do. So there's either one to four, five to nine, or ten or above is a different kind of review process for those. Um, and I so think right now we got eight, eight to ten. So, yeah, so whatever you subdivide as, and then you know, if you decide that whole the the ca the cabin spot is then you know one larger lot, and and the houses are, are separate ones, um, you'll just go through that subdivision process. But I think I think we can work through how to to sort of get you guys through that process, um, just depending on. If it is smaller, smaller lots, then you guys can put in a zone change, and we can we can review th through that and see. Like I said, I think some of those, some of that area down there maybe makes sense to be an R three. And I know I brought up with David before that I camp subdivided into half residential, and I don't even remember how really that process got approved. And that falls back on us in the city of of looking at how that was done. But that's a precedent you could throw back at us and say, well, I, that happened right across the way. Very um, similar to what we're doing. Yeah. It was right next door. There's R3 behind there. Right? There was, I remember there, yeah. didn't R3 change what it walked behind us. So it's very similar to what it is. And he was saying, you know, it, it does make sense to change it to R3 because it is what it is around. Um, but I want to be considerate with the housing. We didn't just throw a campground in the middle of, you know, someone's backyard. Yeah. Um, but obviously, when you subdivide something, people that are purchasing, they're aware of, you know, campground. You know, they're fine with it. But to put it right in somebody's backyard, that hey, we've lived there forever. I don't want a camper right behind me. So that's why we tried to make so do you it have work. Fencing separate them, or um, how would you? I would. That's what I want. Okay. I I like to tent in the whole thing and do I mean, you go up north, you see subdivisions they go in and they put nice fence around subdivision. And then I'd like to separate the subdivision from the campground obviously. If I don't want that. I mean I had I had it drawn like that attention pond grass area to where even uh, behind people's homes there is that separation. Um, grass area. It's not just right in somebody's backyard. So we would still have a separation between someone's yard to the campground, between the grassy area, the road separates it. I mean, yeah, of course, it stands to be great, but Anna wasn't really thinking in that much depth right now. Um, but, I mean, we have the 36 foot road, sidewalks on the, in between, and then on the other side of the 36 foot road, on the campground side, I did keep another 10 feet just as whether it be a grassy area, put a fence up, whatever. And then you still have a road for the campground that wraps around that is at least 12 to 20, yeah, 12 to 20 feet, I guess it's piece of one way or two ways. So there's still a pretty big, I mean, we've got 48 feet plus another 30 feet. So I mean, we have a pretty big gap between the property houses, their front yards to where the campground is. It's quite a ways. Um, but yeah, obviously. Yeah, except for that, that one lot on the cul-de-sac is the only one that would be considering to really considered to be adjacent to it. Um, that one. The one on the far. That one. Oh, that yeah. one. Uh -huh. um, yeah, but I did have that kind of grassy area, whether that's right. the pond. You've got or, the retention and pond. That's and why I didn't measure that out. I think, that, I think that's not our choice right. that goes into, mm -hmm. you know. That yeah, goes in the design design opinion, division, someone whether they yeah. want to purchase a house there or not. Um, yeah. I think, you know, moving forward with an R3 zone change definitely gives you the most flexibility. Um, so if you wanted to move forward with that, because like I said, it will allow for smaller lots. It won't hold you to those bigger ones um, if you just start to, to move things around and make some changes. So if that is kind of the, the next step you want to go forward with us is and, and you'll submit it for, for what your parcel is and then as a group here we will review does it make sense to look at further areas within that. Um, we've talked about a lot of areas that are already smaller lots that would that are just kind of a blanketed R1 on them and it, maybe it makes sense to break those up a little bit more. So um, I think, yeah, that would be the next step to 
to get your zoning and conf you know to conform that, and maybe you end up doing them all bigger anyway, and that's still fine. Yeah. And then, yeah, your, your subdivision, however many lots you end up subdividing the size, your subdivision will come to us next. And then, as far as like the individual lots, do you, because we haven't ever done this before in a whole subdivision, um, with the idea of possibly doing, I mean, I even thought of like twin homes, you know, they were they able to save some on the cost because it's, I don't, I don't know if it's Greenberg, there's no twin homes there. So, there's different things that we were looking at. Um, with this, did, the R3 would allow for these different type of homes if we decide to go that route. We just haven't decided, so we, I kind of want to do some type of research and see really what do surveys, what do people want and what they need, so, what can they afford. And so, the, the survey that was done previously was they all want single housing. Uh, single family housing, um, but in reality, they can't afford they can't that. Afford it. And that's why and we're so to think of how did we afford our first home? We had so our, you know, yeah, our payment on it. Yeah. You know, I think there's house. valid what so you're saying of like a good mix. There's people that are currently renting and are in a state where they want to go bigger, making a family. There's people that are just coming to town, new deputies, new teachers, new everything that need to just kind of start out small. Um, so I think you're going to have the best market in being able to do a mix there. Um, go to Epicenter, talk to them. I don't totally want to advocate, but they've, they've done this research and they'll, they'll help you with some of those answers of, of where the market's at and everything. Um, Would we need to be able to get this approved in R3? Do we have to know details or is that something, hey, we switch R3 as we develop it? Like I said, the banks I've talked to, they're totally for it. We'd love to do something down there. We think it'd be great. Yeah. That's not there. And they said they're able to help with, as as builders, as good rates, just like they would. They're great big builders up north. They said they'll help you with great rates. And they said, even with your buyers, we can help them with lower rates um, because we're working with you. So, I mean, there's things like that that are telling me that can help people with the lower rates than what, I guess, is typical right now. So, you know, we just need to one step first, you know, first step first is getting the zoning right. Yeah. Or we, can go to the we don't, we don't have to know all the details for zoning yeah. change. You'll, you'll look at it as a parcel as a whole for just the zoning change. So you'll say we own this chunk. We want to rezone this whole chunk. Um, when you start to get in the weeds of the subdivision and stuff, that's where you're going to have to break it down more. But just for the rezoning, you're going to say we want to take our parcel, however many acres it is, and we want to rezone that to R3. Um, that'll definitely give you the most flexibility also with these multifamily options. Um, so the only reason I would discourage it is just it's already an R1, and if you feel what you're doing conforms with R1, keep it. Uh, but if you're thinking you want a little bit more flexibility there of those options, then yeah, go ahead with the zone change. Definitely flexibility. I think it means that. Yeah, that'll be your first step, and, and we don't need to know the details of all your lots or anything for the R3 right now. My one concern is would that kind of the campground that they're talking about, or a uh, tiny home village, whatever you want to call it, would that need to be subdivided with each individual home? Or would it fit under the traditional use? It's not going to be run like a campground. They're going to retain ownership of all that. They're going to be like cabins in, in any of the campgrounds we okay. have right now. As long, that's why I was checking that it wasn't going to be long-term rentals or anything. Yeah. If they're running it just as a, a rental business, like a campground, but just cabins, not Okay. Spots. And we'll do, like you said, conditional use, call it tourist homes, rooming houses, boarding houses, whatever you call it. And then we'll approve that whole area. <coughs> For that, yeah, that lot. Okay. I have a question. When, if something is done like that, is there a, a, a how many vehicles are allowed? There is there is something about that? Yeah, there's, that's because determined in in the permitting process. Are you talking about the, the subdividing? So the subdividing the lots will become residential. That's just like any home in town. The commercial, that's within the code, how many basically parking spots you need based on what your commercial is, your size. I mean, every, every commercial building in town has an equation of how many parking spots they have to provide. I'm just thinking of So they would have to be aware of that. And I'm assuming with cabins, you're, people are going to want to park right at them, so you're going to have... We have areas for yeah. each one to have a parking spot. 
And then you have like it, just for Green River to be aware of and try and learn lessons from Moab, like these all these things to go out and play in the desert. Like how many of those you have at a rental unit and driving up and down the city? I think uh, I think it would be really um, beneficial for Green River zoning and city and mayor and everyone to to try and learn lessons from Moab and and figure out how to make it work to benefit Green River and to understand what happened in Moab. I think what we need to learn from Moab is. They already had rules to follow, they just didn't enforce them. And now they're starting to enforce them. Green River is the same. Are you going to enforce it, David? <laughs> I've been trying. I think it's a valid comment for something for them to consider. You know, people come in with their trailers, they come, I don't you know, need there's, to take there's away more your, 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 your desires. I'm just looking <laughs> at a broad. No, I, I think definitely it's, it's a suggestion to them. I think, you know, we can't stereotype that rentals are going to be side by sides and this and that. Um, you know, anybody, yeah, can, can't that. anybody can come in just hiking through and I'm tired of sleeping in a tent and I want to sleep in a, a cabin and I'm just, just me and my backpack. Um, but definitely a thought for you guys to have to, you know, how do you. I would talk to the adjoining landowners and get them on your team. It's the same counsel I gave my brother out here on Hastings Road because we want to try to have some kind of continuity with our zoning. We just discussed that with our with our commercial zone and not want it to look like a game of Tetris. Do you feel like that's that. the case with this, with our three all-arounds? Yeah, like see, you know, maybe so we can continue with and, and have something bigger than we're just going to start taking each individual's property that they own and zone it to fit their needs and their desires. I would say and then we have our zoning map starts looking like somebody's game of Tetris. I would say give them a heads up a little bit of what maybe your ideas are so it's not a shock when because we have to notify if we rezone and we just did your parcel say um, we have to notify everybody around Mm -hmm. and I don't want necessarily you guys to get in the weeds of zoning because people freak out about if they're going to get rezoned and that's going to restrict me and what does that mean and people don't understand it. Um, but I need to give them a little heads up about what you're doing and get them like so that it's not just a shock to them. It would be my suggestion. People people come in and have a lot to say without understanding a lot. So mm -hmm. and that's why I try to be like said we could have we talked when we first purchased the property as let's just do a campground. That was, that was our thought first was and then we're like. We, the house, we build houses. We want to be able to still help community that way and do it. And because of the whole, you know, hey, put in the campground in somebody's backyard that has already been living there, is that something that is fair to them? If they don't want that, then it's going to be turned into a fight. So, which is why we designed it the way we did to help with that. So, I mean, yeah, obviously you could always have somebody that doesn't like it, but I just feel like it's. I don't know, pretty reasonable the way we design it to not be enforcing anything on another person that's already been living there. Um, it's just like any other subject. I mean, house, they can leave it a tiny hill for them, too, so. Yeah. <laughs> and that's a whole other yeah. thing, trying to get that out of there. <laughs> but, yeah, I mean, it'll definitely be, a, uh, you know, it'll look nice. Yeah. It'll be, mm -hmm. I don't know, I think it will fit good. And everybody we've talked to says, for sure, it's a good thing to think. That have few banks are fighting over who could do the funding with it and stuff because they think it's be really good for down here. But yeah, so I don't know. Do you, I guess we can figure out how to do that. But I mean, that's a little bit. Yeah, we'll figure it out. But. I would just yeah, because if we go for the zone change, they will get notified. So just mm -hmm. so they have a little bit of understanding of why this is. You know, we're rezoning this to R three. You know, it's a cool concept of what you guys are doing and, and being able to, to talk your passion of it and not just them getting a letter in the mail and not understanding it. So, And if they have questions about what that means, whether they're included in that zone or whether they're just adjacent to that zone, it'll be distinguished in that letter. Um, send them in to David to, to discuss that because people think that's going to change something upon them and it's, it's not. So, okay. But cool. Thanks for coming. Okay, we will, so you'll give David on the zone change, he'll just put in the, the application for that and then it'll come back to us. And
Yeah. So do you, just curious on timing, how long do you have to go like that? Cause just because we have to go to banks and we have to go, like where typically does it, how long does it take to do that kind of stuff? And it'll, it'll come to us first. Um, we'll make a decision on whether it's just your parcel or around that. Um, we can do public hearing yeah. as part of that, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so yeah. So public hearing, so public comment will be part of that. We'll listen to public comment on it. We'll make a vote on whether it's just your parcel or whether we want to include others, and then that'll kick to city council the next month. So say this can all happen in sequential order, it would come to us in January. We would basically make our suggestion is what it's called, so we'll vote one way, whether it's just your parcel, whether it's more. We will send our suggestion to the council, and then they will vote. So best case scenario, everything's squared away by February, if, if it kind of goes through in sequential order. Or like March. March, like where March is where we're looking at. Hey, let's finalize yeah. things so if you guys said I'm talking to, some of the struggle David's had with is, is just losing communication with someone requesting it, so put in your request and just and stay in contact with David on dates and things like that, so. If it helps, um, <coughs> we still able to do like those eight uh, subdivisions for the individual homes or, or what they're looking for there, so if that helps. You're okay. still able to do that. It's the tourist homes, boarding homes that need to do that. And our banks talk, so we do it all in stages too. We could, he's like, do you want to start with campgrounds? Do you want to start with the housing? Do you want to do them together? It was something we were kind of like, well, let's get the zoning first, and then we can decide. Maybe we'll do one house and one cabin, another house. I don't know. You know, kind of just see the bank. The bank is open to the Start getting on board with the county about your subdivision too. Um, yeah. We had to have that engineered out, drawn, submitted to the county, and you know how quick the county moves. So um, I would I would sequentially start conversation with the county on what that subdivision is going to be. Yeah, and then you guys have to approve. It's the subdivision wants to come to us as well. So can they do it? Uh, a bird that they did a little bit quicker turnaround with last year's or not last year's last month's meeting? They're able to get it a little quicker. Instead of waiting a whole entire month mm -hmm. to begin, could we do anything like that? I have to have a minimum of 10 days posting to notify landowners. And if we grow, if we include more property, then I have to post and have to have another public hearing for those extras. And that's still a minimum 10 day public notice and posting. And I typically try to allow for as much as possible. So I guess, again, you and I could maybe just look if I can't see that on that map from here, but I will look on my computer closer and just see if there, yeah, what, what makes sense there. Because I think that is an area that makes more sense as R3 than R1. It was the size of lots. So. Yeah, yeah. 2011 yeah. it changed, I think, to the makes more sense. Okay. So we'll see if we can pull more of it in so that it's not just you and if we can kind of get that all done quicker. So yeah, it could be a minimum of 10, well, I need 10 days for the posting, then we have a public hearing. If it gets approved here, it has to then be moved to city council. And the city council, Tyler and Ren are um, the ones that post for that. So if they want it earlier, we'd have to talk to them if they want to call me. I would say it's still probably like 20 day minimum, uh, probably about as quick as we can do. And then even after the subdivision, I guess, well, that's for the zone change. And then the subdivision, it'll be about the same. Going through the county? Yeah, going the county is actually longer. The last subdivision, it was like two months going through the county. Depends on them. I mean, them. Uh, whatever they're signed copies, kind of what you end up needing. Mm -hmm. I mean, it can go through and you can submit it to the county and everything's good, but for them to to get it all signed and posted, you know, depending on what you need that for, your financing, anything like that, that was kind of the, the process that felt like it took forever. Okay. All right, uh, fine, discuss approved in that calendar year, 2024 planning commission meeting dates and times. Do we have any big conflictions with the dates? Do we need to change any specific date for anybody? Uh, I didn't. Or I saw that it was sent. Is it just the same date, days of the week? Yeah, so it should be the 
whatever. Third. Thursdays. Third. Tuesdays. Third. Tuesdays. Tuesdays. Tuesday. I don't even know. <laughs> yeah, third Tuesday of the month. I was still looking for seven o'clock, same time, same days. Seven work best for people. People want an earlier time, or is seven kind of the. It's as good as anything else. Seven works good for me. Yeah. If you move it any earlier, I'm going to be absent a lot. Yeah, keep it seven. Just want to make sure that was. I don't think there's a motion okay. on there, is there? Yeah, there's there yeah, a there motion is. on keeping the calendar as it was posted. So moved. Oh. Second. Yeah. First move, second, Kim. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? All right, six. Discuss for tonight consent agenda that includes November 21st, 2023 planning commission minutes. I'll make a motion to approve. November 21st, 2023, Planning Commission minutes. Second. First, Danny, second, Dustin. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All right, any other discussion? We want yes. I need to make a motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. Okay. Second. Okay. Second. Okay. okay. And signatures? Um, yes. So, what's our chances of getting access what? on the river, up the river? I was here, but I don't know what the chance is. According to the county attorney, it's open. Yeah, well, but I've been involved in this before. Really? As a, probably, yeah, as a 17-year-old kid. Yeah. Uh, using the 